Yes, great to be great to be with you. And uh, on this Resurrection Sunday, I mean, it's one of my favourite times of the year uh, when we are celebrating and meditating upon uh, the centre of the Christian hope, the resurrection of Christ. And we have this question before us uh, this morning: uh, How are the dead raised? How are the dead raised? And it comes straight out of one Corinthians fifteen. And I love this question because it's such a down-to-earth question. It's a question which relates to the world in which we live. Uh, I think that there are very strong reasons to believe in the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus. Um, You're no mud, no fool, if you believe that Jesus rose bodily, physically from the dead. Uh, John Dixon, an historian, has written, and he spoke about it just recently, I think just this week in a podcast, he says this, historians take the resurrection story far more seriously than many of us realise. They all agree that something very strange happened that first Easter. As one scholar memorably put it, there is a resurrection-shaped dent in the historical record And it's quite a puzzle working out how it got there. Uh, So that's a very conservative way of saying that it's utterly credible historically to believe that Jesus uh, rose from the dead. It looks like he rose from the dead. We don't know whether he did or not, but it sure looks like he rose from the dead. And Christians love to roll out these facts, and so do I every Easter, but frankly I get a bit tired of it like it's, I just wish people would take seriously the testimony of Scripture and the testimony of history when it comes to the claims surrounding Jesus Christ. I feel a little bit like when I was a kid one time, I went running into mum and I said to mum, there's a hippopotamus at the back door. And she said, come on, Stu, there's no hippopotamus at the back door. And I said, mum, there is a hippopotamus at the back door. And she said, top Stop telling fibs. It's the kind of thing that little kids do. It's the kind of thing I definitely would have done as a child. She says, come on, Stu. And I said, Mum, I promise you, there is a hippopotamus at the back door. And I kept on going on and on and on. And eventually she came to the back door. And sure enough, there was a hippopotamus. I mean, not, not an actual hippopotamus. It was a big, fat pig from the farm next door had escaped and run to the back door and was at the back door looking at us, sort of uh, snorting, uh, oinking. Um, uh, but I, I feel like that when it comes to the resurrection, you know, Easter, Easter Sunday, I feel like, please, people, just come and take a look. There's something to see there. Uh, but I understand, but I understand um, that coming to believe in Jesus is a lot more complicated than that. But I implore you, if you've never taken the Easter story seriously, just at least give it a read. If it's even possibly true, it's so monumental, it's worth you weighing up. Now, the Corinthians, uh, a first century church uh, in Corinth, which uh, who Paul is writing to here, they believed uh, in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And they believed in the resurrection from the dead, Jesus' resurrection, for good reason. Listen to what it says early on in the chapter we're looking at today. It says this, Paul writes to them, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom, who are, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. See, what he's saying there is that, uh, in part there, he's saying there are people alive today over 500 witnesses who uh, testified that they saw the risen Jesus post him being being hung on a cross. Uh, And and so if you want to check this testimony that we're passing on to you, you can talk to them and it accords with Scripture as well. Uh, So for good reason, the Corinthians believed in the bodily, physical resurrection of Jesus. But what's fascinating is that some of them did not believe 
that they would be raised from the dead. They're Christians, they believe in Jesus, but they didn't believe that they would be raised from the dead. Uh, Listen to what it says later on in 1 Corinthians 15. It says, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? They believe that Jesus rose, but they didn't believe that they too would be raised from the dead. And as I said to start with, what I love about 1 Corinthians 15 is it's a very down-to-earth question to ask. How can, how can or how are the dead raised? You see, most of us don't live, do we, in the realm of the abstract or in the, in the realm of the big ideas. Most of us live in just the daily grind, the nitty-gritty of daily life, Monday to Friday, you know, then we wait for the weekend. That's, that's our that's our lives. And so, you know, you can, you can hurtle into space. You can look back down on the earth. I've never personally done this, but, yeah, I've seen the photos. You've seen the photos. You've seen the videos of earth in space. And I can't help but feel whenever I look at the earth from the perspective of space, I can't help but think what a beautiful ball of tranquility. It's awe-inspiring. It just looks so beautiful and so good. But down here, you know, Monday to Friday, it doesn't feel like that, does it? That's not how I see this little ball called Earth. For me, Earth is all about taking the kids uh, to school and then going to sports and then making dinner and then washing up. Actually, I do very little of making dinner, lots of washing up, playing with the kids, trying to get uh, my work done for the next day, stressing about bills, you know, planning, looking forward to our next holiday because finally we'll get a break. And so out in space, this little ball called Earth takes my breath away. It's so beautiful and looks so peaceful and tranquil. But down in nitty gritty, it takes my breath away for an entirely different reason. I'm exhausted and I just want to go to sleep or, you know, take some time out and watch a show with my wife to relax. And here for the Corinthians, they get, they get this thing about Jesus, but it's such a big, lofty, abstract idea, right? That someone could come back to life and now be at the right hand of the Father in heaven, wherever that is, and live eternally and have an immortal body. It's just so outside the realm of the nine to five that I struggle to get my head around it. I struggle even to believe it, even as a Christian today who does believe that I'll be raised bodily. I struggle to quite grasp it. Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, the church is going, well, I just flat out don't believe it. You know, my mate Bruce, a very common first century Christian name in Corinth, um, my mate Bruce, he died, uh, you know, two years ago. And uh, he is food for worms. He's in the ground. He's dust. He ain't coming back. Or perhaps you've cremated a loved one and you've even scattered their ashes. Boy, that is dead, dead, isn't it? They ain't coming back. It's hard to believe, isn't it, in, in, the, in the face of reality real lived experience that the resurrection hope is our resurrection hope. And that's what I want to talk about today, really drill down on that and say for Christians, the resurrection hope is our resurrection hope. I want to drill down on that and sort of rub it in. And then I want to come back and say, if you're not a Christian here today, This resurrection hope that we have as Christians, our own physical, bodily resurrection hope, is a hope you need. You need to share in this hope with us. Uh, Apparently, uh, 44% of Australians, this is staggering to me, 44% of Australians believe that Jesus rose from the dead uh, in one form or another. That's according to a 2021 fairly recent survey from a credible from a credible resource, 44%. 
There's just a bit over 20 who believed in the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus, just as the Bible describes it. There's still a massive amount of Australians believe in the resurrection of Jesus. But far fewer people live as though it has any real life implications for them. And that's what we're trying to connect to in this passage. That's what Paul is trying to connect. His resurrection means big stuff for us. His resurrection means if we believe in him, we too have a bodily, physical resurrection hope. But Paul, but Paul, what about Bruce? How are the dead raised? 1 Corinthians 15 verse 35, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? And there are two basic points that he makes that are worth, I think, you going away, Christian, and pondering upon. If you're not a Christian as well, go away and ponder on these few verses. There's more in there than I can really talk about today, but he makes two basic points. The first one is, well, uh, we are raised, even though we've gone into or down to the dust, we're raised, we can believe in it, because the resurrection me is the same but different. The resurrection me is the same but different. In other words, the resurrection me necessitates me going to the dust. It necessitates this version of me dying to make way for the new version of me. It makes sense if you understand how glorious the resurrection is. That's what Paul is saying here. And the second point is the resurrection me simply, merely, simply, merely follows in the pattern of Christ. Just as we follow in the pattern of the first human being, Adam, and we take it for granted, so too now we can lock it in because Jesus has come and he is the pattern now of those who follow after him. So first point, we are the same but different. Look what it says here in the next few verses on from verse 35. Um, how the dead raised, with what kind of body will they come? How foolish, Paul doesn't mean his words, how foolish. What you sow doesn't come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you don't plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as it has, as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. You see, we have an analogy for the resurrection, and it's the relationship between a seed and whatever comes from that seed, whether it be a bush or a tree or whatever. He says, when you put a seed into the ground, it's the last you see of it. We might want to quibble over the word death, but right, you put the seed into the ground, it's the last you see of it. It now gives way to whatever grows from it. And sometimes it's quite remarkable, isn't it, the difference? Just imagine the seed and then a, a great oak tree. There's this massive contrast, right? And with any seed and with any bush, they look very, very different. They're the same, but they're different. You can only have one type of seed for one type of bush, like they correlate. There's a continuity, but they're, sa- they're the same, but they are radically also different. So too with the resurrection. The resurrection body that, that, that Christians hope for and believe in is radically different to the body that we now inhabit and enjoy. One is uh, mortal. One is uh, racked by sin and guilt. We can enjoy life, but life is also full of trouble that is often self-generated. We will die will be raised immortal, glorious, sinless. The same but different. This shouldn't puzzle you as Christians that Bruce, who's in the dust, who's been worm food for two years, is going to be raised to new life because his life is giving way to something fundamentally different. The same but more glorious. And so it concludes there in verses... Uh, 42 to 44. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. 
It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. How are the dead raised? Well, the second point here, in the pattern of Christ. How are the dead raised? Well, in the pattern of Christ. Look here uh, in the following verses. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it's written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. Life, our sheer existence, is mind-blowingly incredible, isn't it? I think it's staggering, and I cannot get my head around the fact that I exist at all, or you exist at all, that humanity is a thing. How do we get here? Where do we come from? Uh, I believe that God spoke and we came into being. The first man, Adam, was spoken into existence and we followed on from that. But whatever way you want to think about the origins of humanity, it is amazing. It is mind-blowing. Listen to what it says here in this book, if I can find it, under here. In his book, Sapiens, by Yuval Noah um, Harari, he says here, uh, today, he's talking about here the, the, the survival of the fittest and how we rose to the top, and he says here, today our big brains pay off nicely because we can produce cars and guns that enable us to move much faster than chimps and shoot them from a safe distance instead of wrestling. But cars and guns are a recent phenomenon. For more than two million years, human neural networks kept growing and growing. But apart from some flint knives and pointed sticks, humans had precious little to show for it. What then drove forward the evolution of the massive human brain during those two million years? And here's the point I want you to get. Frankly, we don't know. <laughs> what he's saying is there's something profoundly mysterious and glorious about the existence of human beings, whichever way you want to slice and dice how we got here in the first place. We are, it's hard to believe, isn't it, that, that I am among the most intelligent beings in the entire universe. I think that's laughable, but me, <laughs> I am one of the beings in this universe uh, that are the location of the greatest unified conscious intelligence that we know of. There is no meta, no self-conscious, conscious meta intelligence that we know of in the entire universe apart from us. And I just, for myself, I just know I'm not very in control of the universe. <laughs> I didn't make anything in the universe. I didn't make me. I certainly didn't make me. I don't know how human beings are knit together. I know only the most rudimentary of things about bio biology in the human body. It's staggering, isn't it, our existence? But here's the thing. It's not staggering, is it, that we exist because we just do. It's not staggering at one level because there was a guy called Adam or whatever you want to say or however you want to describe the first human being. Once upon a time, a human being came into being and all these other human beings followed. And so we just sort of take it for granted that we exist, right? Often we don't question it very much at all. It's not mind-blowing that we exist because we just do exist. And basically, that's, that's the argument here that Paul is giving to the Corinthians. He's saying, look, we exist because there was a first human being, Adam. And it's remarkable. It's mind-boggling. It's a miracle. It's, it's beyond really understanding. But we exist because he existed and we're following that pattern. And now we've seen the spiritual man, Jesus Christ, come as a human, die on a cross, raised from the dead, 
as this immortal, glorified human being who can live in the presence of the Father forever. And he is a pattern, a blueprint, the starting point for a new humanity. The simplest, the simplest explanation for our existence is there was a first man and we've all followed. And for the same reason, we can have confidence in the spiritual man, in the resurrection body. We've seen the resurrected one as the first fruit of this new creation and this hope that we have. So uh, Corinthians, yeah, I know Bruce is perplexing and he's dead, dead, he's in the dust. He's food for worms, but there are compelling reasons why you should, should have absolute confidence in your resurrection because of Christ's resurrection. And indeed, that is the great Christian hope, not just that Jesus rose from the dead over there, but in Christ I have been raised to new life over here. And I want to say to those of you in the room today who are not Christians that this is a hope that I hope that you will have one day as well. It's a hope that you need. And Paul makes that clear at the end of the passage that we've just read. Look at what he says. He says something very curious here at the end of 1 Corinthians 15 in verse 56. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. What a curious thing to say. I think I might say something like, uh, you know, the sting of life is death or something like that. But he's saying, no, no, what, what makes death bad is sin. And he's debunking there a popular myth, right? This idea that when we die, we rest in peace. Uh, when we die, the struggle is over. When we die, it's just, it's just all about release from experiences, positive and negative, in this world, in this life. He's saying, no, no, what makes death bad is that when you die, when I die, I die in my sin. And when I die, it's not rest in peace, it's that's when you meet your creator who loves you and has made you. That's when you will have to give an account for your life. And he says there that the power of sin is the law. Uh, it says uh, in Romans that because of the law given by God, every mouth is silenced. Because of the law given by God, we all know that we do bad to one another, to God, to ourselves, and we're culpable. And it says in Romans, even those who don't have the law know the law. It's written on their heart. We all have this sense, don't we? That we're not the human being we ought to be. We're not the human being we need to be. You know it, I know it, God knows it, and we will have to give an account for that. Uh, when we die. Uh, a good friend of mine who lives in Sydney, one day um, having just earned his uh, full licence, he got to go for a surf. His dad kindly lent him his four-wheel drive and he went out and he packed up the car and he jumped in and he put it in reverse and he drove out of the driveway forgetting that his mum had parked behind him and he smashed into her sparkling new Subaru and horrified and freaked out by what he'd done, he shoved into drive and lurched forward and smashed into the roller door of the garage. He smashed the Subaru and the garage. And he said that his dad, hearing all the banging and clanging, came outside and just sort of put his hand on his head and just said, just go, just go. <laughs> this is too much. Son, just take off. 
So he said he did. He said, what can I do? I was like, it was just an awful situation. He sort of navigated his way around the Subaru and he went off for his surf. And the whole time he's sitting there thinking, like he's trying to forget it, right? Like he's thinking, oh my gosh, I can't, li- I want to live in the surf now forever. I would like to become amphibious. This is my new life. But I can't. One day I have to go back and I have to face the music. And Paul is saying here, friend, we have to face the music. We know we're not in control of everything. We know we're a weird, wonderful, inexplicable part of creation. And there is a part of us that just knows there's a God. And here it's saying, yes, and one day when you die, when I die, we'll have to give an account before the one who who has made us. But the resurrection hope is that as I, Stuart White, die in in, in my sin and face God, my resurrection hope is that as Dan was saying on Friday, Jesus has paid it all. We looked at John 3.16 right on, on, on Good Friday. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's the great Christian hope, that if we die in Christ, we die safe. If we die in Christ, we die hopeful. If we die in Christ, we know something better is coming, not something mysterious or dark or terrifying, something better is coming. But it can only be found, that kind of hope, hope, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In his resurrection, By being found in his resurrection, only then can we say, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? What a glorious thing to be able to say. Where, O death, is your victory? See, when I die in my sin, I'm utterly defeated. I'm condemned. I'm brought down to the grave forever, and I face God's judgment and wrath forever. But where is your victory in Jesus Christ? And, O death, where is your sting in Christ? I'm made sinless. The sting is gone. I had another friend uh, who who also lives in Sydney who uh, knew he had uh, the potential of a very severe, potentially fatal reaction to a bee sting. And he lived with this fear. That if he got too close to a bee or got stung by a bee, uh, he could die. Um, it's just something that would be on your mind, right? Whenever you're near a garden or outside in summer, it would be a horrible thing to live with, right? He said, oh, he said, oh, to be able to go out for a picnic, to have a bee uh, swarming around and uh, instead of being afraid of that and terrified and just recoiling, wouldn't it be fantastic? Not for the bee, but wouldn't it be fantastic for him if the bee could just land on his shoulder and he could just slowly put his hand, cup it over the bee, squeeze it, and then just go, and away it went. Where, O bee, is your sting? Where, O bee, is your victory? How much more is it glorious to have this Christian hope? Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? We can just shoot away in Christ. And that is a hope you too can have because Jesus rose from the dead and that's what we're celebrating this Sunday. So I encourage you to come and talk to one of us, myself or Murray who was speaking before, or perhaps you saw Dan at the... Um, the Good Friday service, come and speak to us or the friend who invited you along or just the person sitting next to you and talk to, talk, talk to them about what it means to believe in Jesus and have this hope. Uh, but do something about it today. Uh, let me pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for the resurrection hope and we thank you, God, that it's not a vain, strange, out-of-nowhere Christian hope, but it's our resurrection hope is anchored in Jesus who has been raised from the dead. Uh, He has shown us what it means to have a glorified body. He has shown us what it means to defeat sin and death. 
Uh, God help us, if we are Christians, to keep trusting in that. And if we are not Christians here today, please God help us to think about it, consider it, and uh, and and come to you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.